Bienvenidos a todos. Well, good morning and welcome everybody. I'm going to start with a little bit of logistics, okay? Voy a empezar con un poco de logística. This is going to be a conversation in Spanish, but if you want to listen to this conversation in Portuguese or English, you can go down here to interpretation and you can choose your language. Bueno, esta va a ser una conversación en español, pero si ustedes la quieren escuchar... This is going to be a conversation in Spanish, but if you want to listen to it in Portuguese or English, you can go to interpretation and select your, the language of your preference. Today is World Health Day, and we're going to celebrate it in a very special way. We're going to talk about someone that is no longer a luxury, but rather a necessity, and that is the digital health transformation. And for that, we're going to have some top-notch guests and we're also launch our signature publication the golden opportunity of digital health for latin america and the caribbean in a few minutes i'm going to leave you with my boss who's the head of the social sector but before that we're going to watch a video from a beneficiary and then we're going to kick off this discussion thank you for joining us me parece I find these applications very good because they're on the cell phone. We always carry phones with us at any time we can use them. And the fact that the results of our tests are on your cell phone and they come into the cell phone quickly. I'm also a psychologist and I work with some healthcare providers and my patients can see who their doctors are, who they can turn to if I know them. And sometimes, obviously, even if I don't know them, it doesn't matter, but when they have some time available to see them, all this seems to me has sped up access to our healthcare system so much more than before, because quickly you can have access to your own information and see what doctors to see about what and the results. To me, particularly with the COVID, the fact that results are there and that they're show them to you well and now of course being able to have vaccines and being able to show the proof of vaccination everything has been made easier thanks to this buenos días a todos y todas si la banca comercial funcionara del mismo modo que el sistema de salud las transacciones en cajeros automáticos no tomarían segundos sino días esta frase no es mía but this, this sentence is not mine. I found it in a publication from the Committee on Healthcare in America. Why do I mention this? Because this analogy explains in very simple terms that the healthcare sector has room for improvement in efficiency, quality, and equity. Our studies show that if health quality standards in our region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, were at OCD levels, life expectancy could increase by four years. In order to achieve this, we need to use technology, and that is why adopting digital technologies for the transformation of the healthcare sector is one of the key objectives in our Vision 2025. Today, we will talk about how to achieve this transformation successfully. That is the main purpose of the publication we are launching today, The Golden Opportunity of Digital Health for Latin America and the Caribbean. I am pleased to welcome Reina Irene Mejia, Executive Vice President at the IDB, who will be moderating today's event. Thank you very much, Ferdinando. It is a great pleasure for me to be here with you to talk about the digital transformation of our healthcare systems, which is a critical topic for our region. The pandemic exposed the central core of population health for economies and social well-being. And at the same time, it revealed the serious long-standing uh, structural problems our healthcare systems have. But the pandemic has also accelerated the digitalization processes in all areas. Within a matter of weeks, we managed to make a digital leap that under normal circumstances would have taken several years. And as I have said several times before, we cannot go back. For this reason, we have before us a historic opportunity 
and responsibility to implement radical changes in the healthcare sector that address and overcome these structural problems, taking advantage of the transformative power of technology. This transformative power should focus on providing high quality healthcare services that our people deserve. But how can we achieve this? Well, to talk about this, Today, I am joined by Carlos Alvarenga, Minister of Management and Development at the Ministry of Health in El Salvador, Cynthia Esperanza, National Director of Information Systems at the Ministry of Health in Argentina, David Chemot, Leader for Telehealth and Electronic Health Record Solutions at the Ministry of Health in Jamaica. And on behalf of the IDB team, we have our specialists who are great, Alexandre Bagole, Jennifer Nelson, and Luis Tejerina, who in addition to this are co-authors of this very interesting publications. Welcome everyone. And it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Okay, so one of the main ideas in this publication is that the digital transformation in our healthcare si systems depends on having us a clear vision. That is what we want our healthcare system to be like in the future. This vision must focus on people's health, not on the technology we want to implement. I would like to begin with you, Carlos. Tell us, what was the digital transformation process like in El Salvador and how did you build that vision? Welcome. Thank you and good morning. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Reina, for this opportunity. Thank you, everyone, by the way, for this opportunity to be able to share with you the experience El Salvador has in the area of digital transformation. And as you very well said, I always say out of the bad comes some good. And the pandemic impacted every single sector and highlighted the needs in our healthcare systems, which resulted in challenges, but also huge opportunities. And a golden opportunity is the digital transformation of our healthcare systems. We had to be apart. And I say, I always say, farther apart, but closer together. So technology brought us closer together. We had a lot of this technology already at hand, but we were not making the best of it. And the pandemic helped accelerate that adoption process. Now, in terms of the experience in El Salvador, I have to say that for many years, we had been trying to implement this digital transformation for our healthcare systems. And we had a lot of diagnosis and we had worked with a lot of organizations, PAHO, IDB, who were great partners because they helped us identify our our gaps and what our maturity was in our levels, uh, our degree of automation, what the root causes of our issues were, etc. And I have to say all this in a context of a lot of automation, because there were a lot of uh, initiatives from the Office of the President, third tier hospital, who had done their own development and also the national ministry. And oftentimes there were a lot of clashes. There were a lot of contradictions in our agendas in terms of digital transformation. So the idea of transformation at the very beginning was focused more on technology than our people. And this webinar is very important to address this because yes, we were thinking more about how to use that technology rather than our users. And not only user, which means the patient and our families who are the you know, common thread in our healthcare system, but rather the staff uh, as users, oftentimes who didn't take into account what the needs or requirements of our healthcare um, personnel was in order to uh, do their work on a day in and day out. And oftentimes this resulted in, in clashes because they spoke two different languages. And so that resulted uh, and, and 
mismatches. There wasn't a true north, and we have to say this from the very beginning. We did not have a true north to see where our healthcare system was going, and that is key. We must have a clear vision of what our healthcare system looks like, what our model will be like, what our healthcare network will be like, because we we have to be process based rather than function based what do i mean by this that we thought more in terms of what each healthcare institution was going to do than what the network was going to be and to think about the outcome now we have we were more of a reactive um, in a reactive mode well we were supported we received a great deal of support, and I would like to mention some people such as Jennifer Nelson, Pablo Retice, Marisa Agustino. They helped us find precisely our vision, all as part of a diagnosis. We had to take into account all the previous diagnoses, and what we did was to take into account the diagnosis that we already had. We had to organize it, update it, and we developed a strategic plan. We also had some mediation, and here it's important to have political strategic mediation. In my country, I had to play that role in order to in bring together all the different visions that sometimes were contradicting but they had to see we had to see what they could contribute also in order to develop a much more solid vision in a short mid and long term so we organized a, like i said a strategic plan uh, we focused on the patient their families their communities and that's basically the focus throughout the entire health system because really the focus is the person the patient themselves. So we worked a lot on processes, mainly essential processes such as ER, hospitalization, um, surgical op operation theaters, and so on and so forth. And then in terms of the strategic vision, we focused on many elements, but also at the operational level. We have to say this, the best ideas come from those that are working there in the first line in each one of the different healthcare facilities with daily contact with patients. And that's where most of the ideas came from, the ideas that we implemented in order to develop this new proposal. And of course, we developed a modernization table, table that focused on two very important elements. Number one, a document that talked about the innovation and healthcare ecosystem with the six main components, infrastructure, connectivity, uh, systems components, people, culture, knowledge management, and then we established a roadmap for the health, um, the for the digital health plan. This was a digitalization plan, a human resources plan, and it was developed in stages throughout times. We worked on also a functional organization with the support of the team, we also realized based on experiences that we had, that we needed a multi-stakeholder team, not only with IT experts, we included medical personnel and also a very technical, a very technological approach. We, basically, the team had covered many different areas and that's what really strengthened the, the work. The team worked on system management, data management, and so on and so forth. Something else that needs to be underscored is that we had software that could be adapted, but we also uh, considered developing our own software. There was a very heated discussion, and at the end, we decided to develop our own software and that has been strengthened slowly by, but steadily. We took into account international good practices for it. In a very short period of time, we have really obtained a great deal of development. By June of this year, we will have interconnected all healthcare facilities in the country. Therefore, I mean, we clearly have an advantage because uh, my country is quite small and this is a great opportunity in order to have very solid and strong interconnections. Currently, all second tier hospitals have interconnected 
activity. There's already systems that have been implemented and those that had their own platforms have also interconnected with other hospitals. The pandemic forced us in a way or pushed us to develop telemedicine, virtual trainings, data uh, to focus on data management and so on and so forth. So as a conclusion, we've actually achieved a great deal of progress. And I would like to highlight some elements. Number one, you need to have a clear vision of the health system that you or model that you want to implement. It has to be a system-based appro based approach. When we talk about the healthcare system, you need to make sure that your vision is ordered, is organized, uh, you have to see what are the capabilities that you have and how they could be strengthened. Then you need to see the functions that the healthcare system plays, as well as the results that we want to achieve. That's the general vision that we have. And like I said, the core element is a patient. Thank you very much, Carlos. Very interesting, everything that you mentioned. And like you said, we need to focus on who we are providing providing those services for. Alexandre, now it's your turn. We would like you to talk about your experience at the IDB. Why do you think this is a unique opportunity and what tools do we have to make it happen? Thank you very much, Reina. Like you said, this is a unique opportunity in terms of digital transformation. First, because as we could all see, the pandemic brought to light the gaps in the healthcare system. But like we said with Dr. Alvarenga, it actually fostered a great effort of innovation and digital transformation to address the emergency. What seemed impossible two years ago became a reality. And we saw many examples. This is a unique moment to build up on these steps and uh, close the gap in terms of healthcare systems. Digital transformation plays a key role here. It can help improve access levels as well as quality and efficiency of healthcare systems. But like you said, the key is to have the right tools in order to do so. And that is why the publication that we are presenting today provides uh, guidelines and instruments to help countries to do so. First of all, we provide them with tools in order to develop a vision of their future vision for their healthcare systems. There's something key that I would like to highlight. The most important thing when it comes to healthcare digital transformation is not the technology itself. The most important thing is that vision and that strategy in the country in order to achieve this vision. Second, we also propose tools in order for countries to have a right and objective diagnosis of their current situation. We provide them with tools to analyze legal frameworks or tools in order to analyze, for example, electronic health, uh, medical records, guidelines to address cybersecurity matters, or instruments to address the maturity of healthcare systems in order to implement telemedicine projects. Yes. And we also provide guidelines for countries to actually transition from their current situation to their future vision. And we have worked more with more than 15 countries in the region. Argentina is one of them. We will hear in a second, but for now, I'll just hand the mic over to you, Reina. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Alexander. And like you said, yes, this is a, about our vision, our vision of our future, and the end user has to be in the center of it. Who is benefiting from this? As a reminder, here I have my iPad where I will receive all the questions that at the end of the panel, we will have a Q&A session so we can answer questions from the audience. So please share them through the chat. I will receive them through my iPad and I will make sure to pose them to our panelists. We all know that digi health and digital transformation is a complex process that involves institutional changes and new rules of the game. Cynthia, 
The ITB has closely supported the Ministry of Health of Argentina, and you have done an outstanding job. Tell us, what have been the main components of this transformation process, and how did you overcome the challenges that you encountered? Thank you very much, Reina. It's really hard to be brief, but I'm going to try. Like you said, the support by the ITB was truly important, and we really achieve that make us feel proud. The most important components that we worked on once we defined a global vision, and at the beginning of the pandemic, it really helped when we worked with a roadmap, uh, meetings, trainings, workshops about the future state of healthcare. So, like I was saying, once we had that global vision, which an important element um, and a key challenge was to work on infrastructure, the new as well as the new ways to develop that are more practical, more user-friendly, they're sustainable, financially speaking, because this is also very important. And there's another key element, the, maybe the most important one. We've heard Carlos talk about it. And this is basically to work on management, the chain, uh, to work on management, the change itself. And what do I mean by this? Well, basically to review processes, to see what is going to be done, for example, in the first year healthcare facility, how that information is going to be sent to the hospital, how then the patients can receive the information, their medical records, so that they can go to specialists. And you need to develop processes, you need to implement them, you need to understand the different stakeholders that are all part of the same team. It's not only about doctors, we have psychologists, IT experts, economists, and so on and so forth. We consolidated all that. We, we need to continue to work on it, translating all that knowledge to make sure that it's a win-win for everyone. And this is where we saw that it was very important to translate all this to, and promote a public policy, which is multi-dimensional and develop guidelines that are accessible to all the different disciplines and to also generate interest at all levels, by all disciplines. Change management involves many things from the first year, contact with the patient, uh, or, the, or contact between the patient and the two managers that need to develop different protocols such as vaccination protocols, pediatrics protocols, all the way to macro levels that involve staff that are in the Ministry of Health. You have technicians and experts, but also politicians. And we all have a key role to play in order to policy. But you need coordination at all levels. You need to manage the change at all levels. You need to understand all the processes and to rethink them through the technology. So we received a lot of support I would like to thank, for example, Luis Tejerina, because he he supported us um, all the time with very specific instruments, but also basic, basically just being with us, promoting the management of change, learning from important differences in the region for us. All that was key to have direct contact with other countries in the region so that we could talk about common problems that we were facing and the, how they solved them. And to conclude, I just wanted to highlight that in my country, the most important thing is also related to what was said at the beginning of today's session. And that is that for us, the most important is aspect is that citizens started having direct 
interaction with different technology options that would resolve something related to public health. So the citizens can use an app and make an appointment to access a vaccine was a major thing. It was unprecedented. It, you know, it was not possible before for 40 million people to access the scheduling system and the day after getting the vaccine, being able to access that vaccination certificate and also access to their COVID test results via an app. So this changed because we saw that the citizens could see uh, specifically that technology helps improve their health, especially uh, in terms of service management. So in the middle of the pandemic, we implemented e-medical records, and that's when we, where we saw the major uh, result of change management and new ways of doing business. So again, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of today's session. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And I would like to highlight two of the things that you mentioned. Once again, there's no way we're going back. We have seen the specific benefits that this brings and how quickly our users adopted technology. So thank you for sharing that. And also communicating, sharing best practices so that we can all see what our neighbors are doing. Now, Jennifer, you are one of our digital health transformation champions here at the IDB. How can we ensure that countries don't simply buy software and hardware, but rather invest in a true transformation agenda that is inclusive and sustainable in the long term? Well, thank you so much, Reina, for your question. And it's a true pleasure for me to be here with you today. Well, one of the things that we use, like some of the other presenters mentioned, one of the things that we use to guide our investments and to make sure that they are balanced was uh, to use uh, uh, different dimensions and also to ensure that we're following our digital development principles, which the IDB endorsed in 2018, as well as PAHO's eight principles of digital transformation, which were endorsed by all countries in the region last year. Just to be very concrete, if we think about these six dimensions, we think about our digital health house, because it is a house at the end of the day. When we think about a house, we must remember how important coordination is, which is something that we also heard from our experts this morning. So we can imagine if we were building a house and the carpenters, the architects and plumbers went by different blueprints, that would be a big mess, right? So if I may, I'm going to give you a quick tour of our house, beginning with the foundation itself which represents the basic aspect, but very important, which is connectivity and devices. In our house, we also have different rooms. So we need to have digital applications and services that are important for people to interact with our system. The house also has a roof, and this roof reminds us of how important policy and practice in info, informed health policy is. The house is also has walls, one uh, that is governance and management and the other one people and culture. Something not so easy to see but critical is what we call our infrastructure, infrastructure, that is to say all the pipes and wires that are behind the walls that allow information to flow securely and safely using standards. But that is not the most important thing when building a house. We need to make sure that the house is built in a coordinated and balanced way and to ensure that the house is accessible and inclusive for all. So we need to make sure that it is built in a sustainable way, both financially and environmentally. 
but it's not enough to think about ramps and solar panels. Rather, we need to ensure that no one is left behind and that, that our digital transformation is built with everyone in mind. And we are constantly monitoring who is benefiting from this building. Now, some reflections that we can make while we build these very important homes are, are we sure that everyone has access to the internet? Are we also sure that the people that can use it can also use it if they have some sort of disability? Are we harming the environment by removing some devices? Well, right now, right now we don't have all the answers, but hopefully the guide will support us in putting this issue of digital transformation on the table to keep fighting and building our home brick by brick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. I understand that Jamaica has approved their national plan for information systems for health and was one of the first countries in the region to champion this framework. Can you tell us how Jamaica sees digital health benefiting patients, doctors, nurses, and the implementation of their national plan? And I'm, I'm going to throw the other question there, so I do it at once and, and maybe you can complement. And how, how important was it to, to partner with institutions in developing this framework? Buenos dias, buenos dias uh, a todos. I would like to take the opportunity to thank everyone on behalf of the Ministry of Health and Wellness, uh, Jamaica, and indeed the people of Jamaica in inviting me to speak at this conference. Um, Jamaica is on the verge of a comprehensive digital transformation in the healthcare field. And one could say that the captain steering this ship on, on this journey is the National IS4H strategic plan, which gained approval uh, late last year. As a ministry and a nation, we view the emergence of digital health as transformative, not only to our patients, but to our care providers and administrative stakeholders. Now, to answer your question, I'll be breaking down these categories of persons listed and um, speak of the benefit for each category. But and you will clearly see uh, the stated benefits aligned with the strategic domains of the IS4H digital transformation plan for them being one, management and governments, two, data management and information uh, IT technology transformation, three, innovation, and four, and not least, knowledge management and sharing. I'll be also sharing some of my experience as a practicing medical doctor within the early days of these digital transformation. I will start, of course, with our patients who are centric to this process. The benefits to our patients, let's start with increasing efficiencies by reducing waste, wastage of time. This is especially important in primary care where we could have 200 patients uh, per shift in the morning, evening, visiting a clinic. And the paper record is a slowdown of our speed bump in this process. The file has to be located, the patient has to be registered, the file has to be brought to the clinic. All of these things take time. Having the EHR allowed for elimination of much of this uh, waste, wastage of, uh, in terms of time, and allows our patients to be registered and seen very quickly, often if they presented on a day which was not a, their clinic uh, appointment. And of course, the patients got through their, their visit and were able to go about their business and that engaged, um, improved their engagement. Patient engagement has improved as well. At the hospital where I worked, having the EHR has had a very uh, important effect. For instance, our diabetic patients, uh, seeing their HbA1c graph on the EHR, they were more likely to understand the progress of the diabetes. And some patients would say, okay, my diabetes is getting really out of control. And some of them would request that they would take their cell phone and take a photo of the, the HbA1c graph, sometimes with a happy face, sometimes with a sad face. Thank you. And well, okay, <laughs> some more. Uh, in terms of the patients, um, sense of alignment and pro uh, progress you know some of the patients would see these digital tools on the on the television in the united states and having seen them in their own arena made it uh, them realize that okay this digital transformation is real and it's coming to them as far as our physicians uh getting that information to, to make the right clinical decision at the right time was very transformative as well for instance in the 
we was done prior to these digital tools, we had a results logbook that was very big and you had to stand in a very long line to actually get the results for the patients. Now you can get them on your cell phone, you can admit a patient in accident or emergency and on your way to the ward, you can have those results ready for you to make a clinical decision on time. And we all have heard of how the electronic health record has sometimes negatively affected how we interact with our patients. We're stuck in front of a computer screen and we don't talk to our patients. But we had the experience, we initially we had that problem, but we trained around it where we said, okay, you look your patient in the eye, you speak to your patient, and then you turn and you record the record. And so that um, quite interestingly had the counter, uh, counter effect where it actually increased uh, engagement. Our nurses were routinely left out of much of this digital transformation and because their process is completely paper-based, but now the EHR is here, they're able to record their notes on the ward or in the clinic and they feel uh, a part of this process. So the National IS Forage Plan, along with our uh, help and a uh, you know, really wonderful effort by our IDB partners has really steered us in a very good positive direction. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, um, David. La publicación analiza a profundidad. This publication analyzes, examines a lot of the topics that we have mentioned today. I would like to congratulate Ferdinand and the author because of this top notch knowledge product, which uses a very entertaining narrative to address quite technical topics. Luis, I understand that you worked for several months on this report. Now tell us, what are like the five major takeaways from this publication? Thank you, Reina. Indeed, a lot of the work had to do with transforming this complicated technical uh, content into an easy to understand narrative. And the five takeaways we have are first, getting the digital transformation right is urgent. In the region, we have a scarce resources, a growing trend in healthcare spending and a restrictive fiscal situation. So we cannot afford to make decisions without information and make investment in digital issues that do not achieve the desired results. Second, we need to start with the problem, not the solution. We need to make sure that we're clear on what the problem we're trying to solve is. Use a specific technology may be tempting. It seems common sense, but we need discipline to start from the problem and only then look for the best solution, which uh, many times may not be technological in nature. Third, it is very important to have a shared vision of what we want to achieve in the long term. The digital transformation is a long process, a marathon. And if the vision is not uh, achieved by consensus in the healthcare ecosystems, we will hardly say, stay in the court, in course. Fourth, let's avoid basing our strategy on the purchase of technology. It is difficult to ignore the urgency of buying technology when we have key information information on obsolete servers that can fail in any minute. However, if we want to change and improve the way we do things, we need to take a step back and think that what we need to change in terms of regulations, uh, culture and institutional processes in addition to technology and uh, going along with what Jennifer was saying. And fit and something very important for our region is that in the region, we start from a situation of greater inequality in every sense of the word compared to other regions. So digital transformation should be a tool to get out of that situation rather than deepening inequalities in the region. This is a real risk. And in order to avoid it, we must be intentional and proactive in, de in designing our digital transformation program so that no one is left behind. Thank you. Gracias, Luis. Definitivamente. Debemos asegurar Thank you, Luis. Yes, we need to make sure, we definitely need to make sure that this transformation does not deepen inequality and is inclusive of vulnerable populations. And before moving on to questions from the audience, I've received many. I would like to emphasize that the health sector is a priority area for the IDB. We have a portfolio of 49 loans for, uh, for 3.2 billion, of which 200 million are actually earmarked precisely for digital health in more than 16 countries in the region. 
I would like to highlight a key fact that Ferdinand mentioned at the beginning. If we improve the efficiency and quality of health care systems, life expectancy would increase by four years. Imagine four more years of life. Thank you, everyone, for shedding light over this issue. We have received several questions from our audience. So let's start with one from Alonso Verdugo. A question for Luis Tejerina. How can we support governments in order to overcome their fear to use the public clouds? In, and this has to do with data sovereignty. So Luis, the floor is yours. Thank you, an excellent question. All technologies will generate certain uncertainty and a cautious, uh, and certain cautiousness. And being cautious is okay. We need to look at new technology. Conscious manner, but if you can play, you can touch. We can te you can test. How can I use this new technology? That way, you can start developing trust, and that happens with interactions with the technology, and then things actually go right. If I can start having something small in the cloud, and I get to test it, I get to understand how it works, what the risks are, then I can start developing such trust in a new technology such as the cloud and start to see that I want or not to start using it. Um, maybe how I would like to use it. All technologies come with a risk, but again, that's not a reason not to try something new. It's a reason to learn how we can protect ourselves from those risks and learn how to use a new technology. That could be very helpful. Thank you very much, Luis. Now, the next question from Ezequiel Reynoso. Question for Jennifer Nelson. Which ones do you think will be the main issues in terms of cybersecurity linked to or taking into account rather the issue of data? This is a very important question. Let's think about our house again. How do we make sure that those that come in are precisely the ones that we want for them to come in and make sure that people have access to very specific things? In the publication, we address this matter from different perspectives, governance and management. We have a lot of experiences uh, in our region. We have good laws in terms of data management. And then in general, talking in general about cybersecurity, we need to address it. Health is one of the most hacked sectors in the world, and it's not that easy to change it. I can easily change, for example, my debit card, but I cannot change my blood type. So it's important to make sure that the equipment that we use, the way information flows between those devices, and then humanware. We need to make sure that uh, we are taking all measures needed to take care of mm, such information. Hopefully, the guide will provide the right tool for you to use and have an understanding of how to address cyber security issues. Thank you very much. I have other questions, but I'm afraid we're running out of time, but rather, let me see. I will, we have time for one more question. One from Maria Emilia for Cynthia Esperanza. How can we implement digital systems in countries as big and as heterogeneous as Argentina? Great question. This is something that I wanted to talk about, but since I was trying to be brief, I didn't during my presentation. But in Argentina, we have that issue, right? We're dealing with a very large country, different types of regions, and we have a federal healthcare system where different municipal departments are in charge of their health 
their own healthcare systems we, through local governments. We call them, in fact, municipalities, and they have their own strategies too. So it's quite a challenge to coordinate all this. But in order to do so, it was very important to different projects that the ITB actually funded and develop local, provincial, and national governance entities, structures, to make sure and make sure that they're all coordinated with each other. We need to all understand the general vision, where we are going. And then each level will have will need to have their own identity um, to make sure that they can adjust the use of technology to their own needs because there are many differences in terms of, for example, determinant factors of health or the cultures. So, like I said, first you need to develop govern good governance at national, provincial, and municipal levels. They all need to share the same vision. That we need to create teams, multidisciplinary teams, and after that, we can actually implement a federal strategy in a decentralized way, but with all the different actors moving in the same direction. Thank you very much, Cynthia. I have one last question to ask our speakers. I think we have four minutes left or so. Um, I'm being scolded a little bit, but yes, I want to pose one more question. Maria Eisenberg. What value or how important do you think is the, regu uh, is the legal framework or regulatory framework in terms of digital transformation? Do you think that's an accelerator, accelerator or a barrier in this transformation? This is a fantastic question. The regulatory component is key in our digital house. It should be an enabling factor in our digital transformation. Uh, it, it, an example, we carried out a study about clinical records and the regulatory framework in its country. And those countries that have very specific and well-structured regulation that talk about the type of data that is going to be shared, the standards that apply, the role of each stakeholder in this governance have a greater level of adoption of digital transformation. So clearly it's a fundamental factor and we are developing different studies too for telemedicine and we have other tools that we will be sharing with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. As we have seen, we have before of us a great opportunity, but also historic responsibility to transform health, our healthcare systems. Now, I would like to invite Benigno Lopez, our vice president of sectors, to give the closing remarks of uh, the event. Go ahead, Benigno. Over to you. Thank you very much, Reina. Greetings to you all. I would like to congratulate you interesting conversation. We hope that the publication as well as this exchange will be useful in order to understand the enabling um, conditions to implement a successful digital healthcare system. 70% of deaths in Latin America are due to bad quality of healthcare system. 70% digital transformation of key sectors in order to reduce disappointment and, uh, and achieve universal Healthcare is key. For patients, we need greater access, flexibility, and simplicity. Telemedicine allows them to make appointments, get prescriptions, and have a visit from any part of the country. In addition to this, digitalization of the healthcare system also allows us to have a comprehensive vision of of, of each person and the country as a whole. Also for medical professionals, it means knowledge, it means collaboration. When you have data about each patient, you can have specialists talk to each other and improve their diagnosis as well as their treatment. And for countries, it means improving and expanding access to healthcare. They can have 
for example, surveillance and vaccination systems in place and be much better prepared for emergencies. It also means saving in terms of costs, enabling the implementation of strategies to have preventive health care. And finally, I would like to thank the Pan American Health Organization, the hospital, the Hospital Italiano from Buenos Aires Healthcare Israel, and the governments of Japan and Korea. And of course, to also thank you to all the experts who have collaborated in this publication. Digital healthcare provides a great opportunity to benefit us all. Una gran and y exitosa gestión. It's up to us to manage a successful, uh, to achieve a successful management of the system. Thank you, Ferdinand, for a great job. Simplification of the healthcare system through technology will allow citizens to have access to much higher quality health services. Thank you.